I'm Charlotte Harrison. Um, I'm the Director of Employability and a Principal Lecturer at the Portsmouth Law School at the University of Portsmouth um, in, in the UK. And I'm going to chair the session today with some support from uh, colleagues from um, Chinese University of Hong Kong. So um, I'm grateful to them for that. Uh, we've got three presentations in this group then, uh, delivered by six speakers in total. There is a slight change to the programme originally published, and I'll just walk you through that now before we begin. Um, so if we're going to start with um, Dr. Arimoro and Dr. Egbe, uh, who are going to speak to us first of all with a live presentation. Um, we're then going to move in a slight change to the programme to the recorded presentation from Dr. Hughes Gerber, um, Dr. McCurk and Dr. Sava. They will have a recorded presentation, but then um, a Q&A live directly after that. Um, and then finally, we're going to hear from Miss Nisa Curian, who's going to offer us an analysis of student and teacher wellness in the teaching and learning environment. So while I just do a few housekeeping measures, um, it might be worth our first presenters just um, sharing their screen and, and loading the slides so that we can get on. Um, so in accordance with the format that you're used to now from this session, each of our presentations will last uh, for between 15 and 20 minutes. Um, we have 25 minutes in total for each presentation. So depending on how long our speakers talk for, we should have around five to eight minutes of Q&A um, at the end. Um, I'll be keeping time and I'll let the speakers know if they're getting close to their time. Um, please do send questions to me directly um, in the chat as we're going through the presentations as things occur to you. Um, or there will be time at the end for you to pop them in the chat to me. Um, please do take the opportunity to ask our speakers questions directly while they're here with us. Um, it looks like we've got a really good range of presentations coming up with some nice uh, synergies between them. Um, and then I'll moderate the, the chat at the end of each presentation and ask the questions. Um, so hopefully that's clear. Um, and welcome to, to all of you um, and thank you for joining and it's my pleasure to introduce our first um, speakers today. So first of all we have Dr Augustine Arimoro who is a lecturer at uh, Roehampton Law School at the University of Roehampton in London. Um, he's an active researcher and has contributed several articles to leading peer-reviewed journals and is the author of Public Private Public Partnership in Emerging Economies, a monograph published by Rootledge in 2020. Joined by Dr. Tammy Egbe, who holds a lectureship in law at the Univer Nottingham Trent University uh, in the UK, an active researcher and has contributed articles to leading peer reviewed um, journals. And they're going to speak to us about enhancing students' engagement during seminar sessions experience at a UK law school. So I'm certainly going to be uh, pricking up my ears for this one and hopefully getting some tips. So welcome to you both. And if you'd like to, to take the screen, then we'll begin. Hello everyone and, and good day, depending on the time of the uh, day, wherever you are. Uh, this presentation is entitled Enhancing Student Engagement During Seminar Sessions I Experienced at UK Law School. Uh, in this uh, uh, discussion, we share experience teaching uh, seminars to undergraduate law students at the Nottingham Trent uh, Law School. Uh, my name is uh, Augustine Arimoro. Uh, as have been introduced. I'm currently a lecturer at the uh, University of Roehampton, London. I was previously a lecturer at Nottingham Trent, and I'm together with my colleague, Dr. Igbe. So uh, to provide a bit of uh, a background to what we are going to talk about today, uh, um, we will begin with an overview of um, the session, and then we'll provide some background to the discussion. Uh, this will be followed by a hint on how the law program at uh, the NTU is delivered. Uh, next is an introduction to the seminar method, which is uh, the method used at the law school. Uh, we will follow uh, on with the challenges encountered while we were teaching during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as to ret on return uh, to um, in-person teaching. Uh, we would conclude the presentation with a highlight of some of the lessons that we learned in the process of delivering uh, seminars and the ideas we have uh, for the future. So for a uh, background, the LLB program at uh, NTU is uh, designed to provide 
intellectual, legal, and practical skills that uh, students need for a, a successful career, whether as solicitors, barristers, or uh, the academia or the corporate world, among others. Now, uh, the program at NTU, that's the law school, uh, complies with the requirements of the Solicitors Regulation Associ uh, Association, the SRA, as well as the Barita Barista Standards Board for the purposes of uh, uh, professional qualification as a solicitor or barrister in England or Wales. And I'm Wales, uh, beg your pardon. Uh, in the training of students at the law school at NTU, emphasis is placed on the acquisition of relevant skills uh, that so that when students go on to work after graduation, they will have the skills uh, that they need. Uh, similarly, students are prepared uh, for the SQ that the solicitor's qualification exam or prepared for progression uh, to the barristers training course for those who are intending to become barristers. Now, a significant part of the modules taught at NTU is the incorporation of relevant skills, uh, not just uh, the substantive law content. For example, contract is taught with problem solving, uh, taught is taught with legal reasoning, public law is taught with research skills, um, European Union law is taught with presentation skills, criminal law is taught with uh, mooting, land law is taught with professional advice, and trust is taught with uh, uh, legal reasoning. Now, this ensures that upon graduation, uh, students have relevant employability skills as well as the skills that they require for uh, further studies. Now, a wide range of assessment methods uh, is used to ensure that students benefit from uh, assessment, not just merely, not just as a test of knowledge, uh, but an opportunity for students to apply concepts. Uh, that they have learned to real life uh, problems. Uh, some of the unique assessment methods adopted at the Nottingham uh, Law School include presentations, uh, mooting exercises, case analysis, research product projects, group projects, and problem solving questions. Okay, that uh, questions uh, with problems. So uh, in, in terms of the seminar method, um, the seminar teaching method is a model in which uh, students work in small groups to discuss uh, questions and issues under the guidance of teachers. The underlying objective for using this method is um, uh, to ensure that uh, students achieve the purpose of learning by discussing and even confronting, confront, uh, con that's confronting real life issues. So traditional lecture-based learning is generally considered as, uh, as passive and compliance is focused on a one-way transfer of knowledge as against um, the seminar methods. Um, I would stop on the next slide uh, that's law seminars and I'll allow my colleague, uh, Tammy, Dr. Egbert to carry on from here. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. All right. Good, good, good. Uh, just to be sure. <laughs> yes. So um, the seminar method often employed at uh, the NTU Law School is premised around the organization of the class, um, which often utilizes a scientific approach to analyze um, problems that have been picked for discussion. It's often a seminar session that is based on um, discussions around the legal problems. Um, and a small group of learners, of course, usually no more than 25 cents will work together collaboratively to solve problems using legal approach and analysis. Uh, it varies from the intellectual initiative because it is um, organized and a supervised discussion with a focus on finding new relationships by the participants in the seminar. And this, of course, gives the student the opportunity to take an active role in their learning. Next slide. Oh. 
So students are uh, often allocated um, seminar groups for all the modules that they um, study. And um, these seminar groups are timetabled to attend a one hour seminar session for each module. And the groups are permanent for the year. This allows for developing um, lifelong skills like teamwork and of course, um, familiar surroundings. Often a member of faculty will be assigned to facilitate learning for each group. The member of faculty will be responsible for dealing with queries from the members of the group, as well as of course, um, marking assessments. The NLS Law School is quite a very large law school and to allow for uniformity, all of the groups um, often utilize the same materials, often prepared by the model leader. Um, standard answers are often provided just to act as a guide for seminar tutors. Uh, these are often distributed to members of the teaching team who often, um, where necessary, that is where they need clarification, can of course use the team channels to um, speak to all team members so that they are in the loop with any um, clarifications that have been handed out by the Moodle leader. Seminar sheets often containing the reading list and problem scenarios are often released to the students via the virtual learning environment. Tutors often have that freedom to lead the sessions in a manner that didn't fit. So they could come in with a session plan and of course lead the session as they um, see fit, depending on what type of students that they do have in the seminars. This however, gives students the opportunity to have their learning um, them, being guided by a standard tutor, especially with um, the guidance made available by the model leader. Some tutors often use the first 10 minutes of the session to reintroduce the topic. They offer some foundation as well by giving out clues to help students. Students are then subdivided into smaller groups of no more than five. Students each will discuss the questions and critique their answers. And thereafter, students then engage in the um, seminar discussion and during plenary, they explain their answers. At the end of each session, tutors are always mindful to give students very useful feedbacks, which often is part of the role of a tutor as a facilitator of learning. So we're gonna now talk about the challenges with this um, seminar style approach. And oftentimes because of the pandemic, delivering seminars had to move online and this came with its own peculiar challenges. One of the peculiar challenges was usually the issues around cameras. Students uh, at, a, at, at the time were happy to leave their cameras on, but as time went on, this um, became um, a challenge. They stopped putting on their cameras. I guess it could be related to the problem of Zoom fatigue as well. Sometimes there was a case of um, them having issues with their microphones as well. And because the cameras were mostly turned off and issues with the microphone, it was often difficult to sort of have this facial feedback, which was very useful for a tutor to determine whether or not a student was actively engaged in the seminar. And since the seminar is not like a lecture, students have to take an active role, but they were online. It was then difficult to get students to participate. And uh, some of my colleagues did air their frustrations a lot of the times with how um, that panned out. And even if we tried the um, breakout room sessions, which was a useful device at the time by Zoom, that also came with its own challenges because it was difficult sometimes for students to engage with the seminar by discussing with their peers. And of course, we also had the technological issues. So members of staff were not necessarily well equipped to deal with the technological um, expertise that is required for um, Zoom and Teams um, um, sessions for seminars. And the success of a seminar discussion often depends on the lively participation of students and the engagement with the text. Uh, a student who is always on the fringe of the conversation will of course be posing a, a, peculiar, a significant challenge to the teacher. Uh, an active listener is surely better than someone who is passive. And um, it's important that as tutors, we need to start thinking about how we can get students engaged, particularly every student in the conversation. Fundamentally, the desire to participate in conversation grows as trust builds. 
So teachers are, of course, at the forefront of um, fostering trust in the seminar room. And this would, offer, of course, happen naturally as we continually to meet individually each student. And in these conversations that we have with students, we can often ask questions to sort of ascertain the challenges that students often face. And by doing so, you then could uncover some reasons why they have not been participating in the seminars. And it's at that point that you then sort of have to encourage them with good coaching, how to enter, get involved in the conversation. It's almost like you then have to become adaptable to each seminar group as you go along. And because each student is unique, and when you build relations with each student, you are able to tailor your advice to their specific needs as participants in the seminar. And because we are tutors, we often take seriously a charge to teach all our students, regardless of whether they have natural gifts. While some students are natural leaders and are quick on their feet in discussions and excellent readers and are even intellectually curious, we might find that some of them are not exactly the same. And because we have this group of students who are intellectual leaders, we should let them raise the bar for class discussion. Uh, this may mean that other students struggle to keep up, but instead of sort of silencing those who are proficient participants, it's important to also encourage and coach your students so that they too can get the most out of discussion. And where there's a lack of trust or where, the, where um, trust has not developed fully, participation skills are often still new and students will often fail to engage each other in the discussion. It can be of some benefit sometimes to have a frank talk with the students and reminding them to address each other in their comments. And as tutors, we often lead this conversation where the intellectual wait in the room. However, the true seminars often depend on the free and organic participation of all the students. We need to be able to help our students engage in adult conversations and help them understand that it's, it's okay to disagree, all right? And the beauty about disagreeing is that it, it um, engenders everyone to strive to a better understanding of the text. Uh, the goal is not to make things personal with your students or become adversarial, but the goal is to explore and better understand some spell of inquiry. We need to see students as partners in learning. And we see the text as our map and we are the guide. And each student has to walk up the mountain, but must do so in company with the, and, and with the help of um, each other in the classroom. We often need to sort of go into this um, or resist the urge to always begin the discussion by asking our students daily quizzes in order to hold them accountable. Uh, we need to pr practice that attempt to force student engagement can often kill the liberal culture that seminars strive to foster. And by introducing the language of grading, we have stepped outside the aims of the seminar. We need to importantly explain the grading policy at the beginning of, this, of the year. For example, 50% writing or 50% participation, whatever um, grading policy is at your law school. But after that, you then assume that they know their requirements and if students constantly come to class unprepared, we need to sort of call the center aside and find out his or her reasons. And perhaps then you can then help him over or her overcome his obstacles. We often do not assume that students are simply lazy or disengaged. And if it doesn't offer a sufficient explanation, it's better we could sort of um, help them understand the value of coming to the seminars prepared and not always resort to this idea that it's about the grades. We often remember that we're inviting our students to an encounter with and discussion of important texts. We cannot make them have the experience. So we need to free the seminar from encumbering considerations that have nothing to do with the text themselves. Students have to have that freedom to follow our lead or not. It's entirely their choice. So we're gonna go into how we can sort of engender or encourage participation. And one of the methods which uh, we've often developed at the Nottingham Law School is the use of icebreakers. And this often helps with team bonding and encourage participations. So we can often build trivial questions around um, foreign affairs. I often like one of my most popular ones where I often tell students that if you're stranded on an island, could you tell me three things that you carry with you? Um, and most of them often say, my phone and I tell them there's no Wi-Fi guys, it's an island literally devoid of Wi-Fi. So that often encourages them and they're quite um, happy to 
tell me uh, a couple of things they will have to take with them or they cannot live without when in an island. And this often helps them to be excited and they're often told in their small groups. Sometimes we often make them um, simulate law firms as well. And this sort of helps them understand how law works in practice. And they're quite happy to say, oh, I am the temporary principal and one other party is happy to be the scribe. And these are appointed to lead discussions and make notes to be used by member of the groups, by a member of the group to explain their thoughts during plenary. So these are some of the methods that we've often um, adopted in trying to engender um, participation in seminars. Uh, we often help with breaking the problem question into bits because students often are overwhelmed when they see a large chunk of text of a legal problem. So we have developed this unique method to get them to understand the parts of a problem scenario and those parts that are very important. And some of them often will um, we'll, we'll start by um, designing a number of questions ranging from 12 to 20 questions, depending on the number of students in the group. And this is supposed to help them boost their confidence. And we then often as a way ask students to pick a number at random. And if a student says, I'm going to pick number five, then we're going to say during the seminar, students will then be asked to do some research for 10 minutes to find an answer to the question they've decided to pick up. Now, a combination of all the questions, the questions individually might not make sense, but when you combine the questions together, they sort of give a clearer picture on how to approach the problem question design for the seminar. So this approach ensures that everyone works, everyone participates in the seminar. Uh, the approach does not give students room to attend without at least saying something before leaving the seminar. And since it's the teacher's responsibility to ensure that um, students participate in the seminar, we also need to ensure that the feedback given afterwards motivates the students and ensure that they strive to contribute in future seminars. And uh, the result is that this approach has worked successfully and has continued to help students engage properly in the seminar. So to summarize what we have um, dealt with today, we have sort of um, introduced learning and teaching approach, the, the learning and teaching approach that has uh, been adopted at Nottingham Law School. We are quite mindful of how the one hour weekly lecture is very important in helping students have some sense of direction as to their learning process. However, this weekly seminars um, provide students with a, a, a better understanding of the learning process, particularly how they can become active participants rather than passive learners in their learning. And the role of the tutor is key in all of this because the tutor must continually to be a learning facilitator and offer guidance. And sometimes this guidance might require some handholding, but it, it, it will only um, get better as students become a lot more confident in terms of their learning um, and process. The approach clearly provides an opportunity for learning work skills that will be relevant to students' future career. Thank you. Thank you to both of you um, for that presentation. Um, perfect timing as well. So I, we do have some time for questions. So I would encourage um, our colleagues to post those to me in the chat and then I can moderate them. Um, it, there's obviously been a lot of work for both of you um, and, and your colleagues, in fact, in terms of planning and then implementing this uh, shift in approach. So I'm interested in, in your personal motivations for embarking on the project, which I think started before the pandemic from the way you presented it. I wonder if you could just share a little bit with us about sort of what, what really motivated you to, um, to embark on this new approach. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Charlotte. Um, what motivated us to embark on this approach was uh, the lack of uh, participation sometimes. Um, sometimes students feel overwhelmed when they have this, uh, like, uh, like my colleague said, when they, have, when they see problem questions because the seminars are taught using problem questions largely. And um, some, when they feel overwhelmed, they don't even want to prepare for the seminar, they just want to come and sit and hear what others will say. 
So we started devising or thinking about which method to apply to age students. So for those who were not able to prepare before the seminar because they felt the question overwhelming, they have an opportunity during the seminar, the first 10 minutes to look at a tiny bit of, um, of the question. Over time, we find out that students begin to gain confidence and begin to uh, gain better understanding of the approach. And we applied the same thing through while uh, the pandemic was uh, lasted. Although it was much difficult, but because we established this process of uh, aiding students and helping students, like my colleague did say, holding their hands sometimes uh, had likely worked uh, for us. I don't know if Tammy wants to add to, to that as well. Yeah, and uh, one of the things in my experience was how um, I went to a couple of seminars when I just um, um, started here at Nottingham Law School, at Nottingham Law School and it was palp it was just pure science, even things like, guys, um, well, because I, I teach contract law and I say, can anyone identify the legal issue? And they all looked around and was, what, what do you mean legal issue? And so that sort of lack of engaging or understanding of the seminars prior to the pandemic even became quite increased once the pandemic had started because now students were on their own, no guidance from the tutor, like as they feel, some of them have complained that I hate online learning. I don't know how to deal with talking to myself on the camera. And all of that just sort of made us think, okay, how do we then sort of help students get involved in the learning process? And one of the things which we devised was the breaking of the problem question into smaller chunks, such that students are easily able to understand, all right, so it means if I want to answer a problem question, I can start by identifying the legal issue. So one of the questions we'll face is, can someone tell me what the legal issue is in this legal problem? And then we move on to, okay, what are the elements of the legal issue you've considered? Someone would then have to do some research around that. So this sort of helps them to sort of perfectly understand ways and, and, and approaches to answer different type of questions in the seminar. Thank you. And have you had an opportunity to evaluate it? You've talked about your own sort of perceptions of how it's gone. I wonder if you've had any student feedback or if you've been able to evaluate progression or, or attainment at all as a result of this or just student kind of experience. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, in terms of feedback, uh, I've had a couple, I have not a couple, actually, I've had about um, three of my groups come back to me and say they quite like that um, 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 approach in terms of the fact that some of them are from, um, what's it called? criminology and, uh, and, and, and business and law, criminology and law. So they do find understanding law problems quite difficult. And they just can't wrap their head around it. For, so for those groups, this particular method seems to be the best approach for them because that way they're better able to understand how to look for legal issues, how to understand problem scenarios as well. So I've really had great feedback from them and I've just done finished marking and it's reflected in their grades as well, such that they, their grades have significantly improved compared to um, um, the grades from, from the year before. Brilliant. Thank you ever so much. Thank you to both of you on behalf of myself, but also um, all the delegates here. Thank you for a, for a brilliant presentation and, and for your candor in the uh, in the answers. So thank you very much. Um, it's time to move now to our second presentation, which I think is going to be a recorded presentation. So we'll just load that up for you. Um, this presentation is by Dr. Laura Hughes Gerber, Dr. Noel McKirk and Mr. Raphael Sava, all from Lancaster University. Um, it's called Looking Back to Look Forward, Mapping the Student Support Pathway for Law Students Through the Eyes of a Legal Academic. Um, and if I can just introduce you briefly to our speakers, um, Dr. Hughes Gerber is a lecturer in law at Lancaster University. Um, her teaching and research interests lie within public international law and international human rights law. Um, Dr. McKirk is a, a lecturer in law also at Lancaster University, and his teaching and research interests are around international terrorism, as well as developing and embedding study skills within undergraduate programmes. And finally, uh, Raphael Sava is a lecturer in law at Lancaster University, um, and Raphael's teaching and research lie in corporate law and corporate governance, with an emphasis on considering legal and economic issues arising from facilitating 
and promoting companies um, sustainable development and all of our speakers are core members of the law department's pastoral support team um, at Lancaster University um, and obviously that's the theme um, of um, a lot of this presentation so I think my colleagues are going to, to load up the recording for us and then we'll have the live Q&A immediately afterwards. Good day, everyone. Uh, my name is Rafael Sava, and today, together with my colleagues, Dr. Laura Hughes Gerber and Dr. Noel McGurk, uh, we're going to present our paper, Looking Back to Look Forward, Mapping the Student Support Pathway for Law Students Through the Eyes of a Legal Academic. Um, I will first introduce um, our work and our conceptual context upon which our research and student support is being established on, and then my colleagues, Laura and Noel, We'll proceed with the ways by which we have started applying our research in one way or another in our existing streams of student support. Now, I would like you to take a moment and reflect back to your uh, past undergraduate selves. Um, at some point, uh, you may have been in need of some form of student support, either academic support in terms of your own academic performance or pastoral care in terms of nurturing in or guiding in one way or another your way through life as you are proceeding with your own academic life. Going back to it, you may have realized that your experience is going to be uh, very different compared to other persons. Yeah, you may remember uh, your experience as being completely beneficial or not beneficial. But what kind of parameters uh, have led you to discern your experience to be that way? Simply put, can you really identify what made up your experience with the provision of student support that you have received? Different experiences will probably lead to different answers in relation to that. And in our research in relation to the systems of student support and the ways by which they respond to the varying dynamics of students, um, we observe and we suggest that this must be expected. Students have various uh, needs that are ranging, pro the ranging on a number of issues. And it is important to develop systems of student support that can respond to that in light of the fact that students' needs have varying dynamics. And in relation to that, our initial findings have suggested the development of a taxonomy upon which we can begin study these elements. Our taxonomy has been developed first and foremost on the observation that most systems of student support in the UK in relation to law schools have been developed with the principle of segregating academic support and pastoral care with minimum, if any, interaction in between them. Um, this has resulted in the provision of academic support and pastoral care almost exclusively as systems providing academic support and pastoral care in isolation. But in light of the fact that students' needs are varying and dynamic at the same time, with certain pastoral care needs informing certain academic support needs, we have argued in a recent paper that we have published that although in theory we need to identify and understand pastoral care and academic support differently, in practice we really cannot do that and therefore we have called for systems of student support to be developed in order to provide academic support and pastoral care holistically. But in light of the fact that we're trying to figure out ourselves the main parameters or the design principles, so to say, by which we will develop systems of student support within law schools that can cater to that, we have developed an initial taxonomy by which we can identify the means and ways by which student support and student support in academic support and pastoral care, respectively, is going to be provided holistically. And the ways by which we have charted this taxonomy is by identifying the factors that may initiate student support and the nature of the student support needs in order to identify the needs of students in relation to academic support and pastoral care, and then decide in one way or another where should the student access that kind of support. Is it going to be at the departmental level or at the institutional level? Is it going to be provided 
by legal academics or professional members of staff or even their own peers. And whether that kind of support is going to be reactive, as in acting after a certain event has happened, or precautionary or proactive in terms of helping students cope with academic life. This has led us to consider a number of questions in relation to uh, what is the role of the legal academic in this? If student support is in need of being provided holistically, how should the legal academic do that? And this is where my colleague Laura is going to uh, guide you through the means and ways by which we have discerned that this may be the case. Thank you very much, Raf. So we've really honed in on our own role, our own perspective as legal academics to consider how we can best support law students. And in doing so, we've discerned a number of key points helpful to supporting law students. Firstly, being aware of key student stress points throughout the academic year. So for example, for first year students, this may consist of the first few weeks of term as they're settling in. And for many students, this may also consist of assessment periods. Secondly, we have found that consulting both student attendance and assessment submission data is very helpful in order to flag students who may require additional support as both a dramatic drop in attendance or indeed an anomaly in relation to an assessment submission. So either a non submission or a late submission may well be a key indicator that a student may need additional support. Thirdly, by structuring contact between academic staff and students, we can really hone in on students who may need additional support and who may not engage with us on an ad hoc basis. So by giving the students the opportunity to speak to us, we can essentially discern whether there are any issues at the moment that are affecting their academic performance and support them accordingly. And finally, by embedding pastoral care into all of our pedagogies. Now, you may be familiar with the term compassion pedagogy, which is a key buzzword at the moment. And essentially the idea behind this being embedding pastoral care, embedding compassion into our own teaching practice in order to support our students. This has then led to us devising a formula to support law students in practice. And it's important to note that this six step formula is not intended to be either restrictive in any way or indeed prescriptive in any way. It's intended as a point of orientation, a starting point that may help legal academics in approaching student support. And we propose the following six step formula. Firstly, contacting the student. And this is important to establish initial communication with the student. And the way in which this occurs will differ from student to student and depending upon that student's circumstances. Secondly, it's important to assure the student to essentially reassure them that they're doing the right thing by speaking to you and you're here to help them however you can. Thirdly, by promoting an open and honest dialogue with the student in which the student is able to relate to you their concerns and any impact that said concerns or circumstances have had upon their studies. Fourthly, signposting the student to appropriate institutional and external support mechanisms. And this is a key part of the role of the legal academic. We're not experts, for example, in mental health. We can't always support the students ourselves, but what we can do is signpost the student to appropriate institutional and external support mechanisms. And the nature of said support mechanisms will differ from student to student. Fifthly, providing the student with information any information which may be helpful in order to access said support mechanisms. 
So this could be the opening times, it could be an email address, it could be a contact number. And sixthly and finally, following up with the student. And how many times this occurs will depend on the nature of the student's circumstances, but essentially checking in either on a one off or a regular basis to see how the student's progressing and encouraging them to continue to access support mechanisms. I'm now going to pass over to my colleague Noel, who is going to talk more about how this formula can be applied in practice. Thank you so much, Laura. So let's take a, a, a look at an example and meet Leah here. Now I should say uh, and reiterate on the outset, this is just one example that uh, typically arises or can arise in the course of uh, a student's studies. And the processes or the uh, adoption of the processes is not meant to be or aimed at being uh, the way to answer this or the, the way to respond. It's more about showing uh, at least one way that this can be approached. So Leah comes to see you as, your, as you are her your head. Uh, she lets you know that her mother has been diagnosed with terminal illness and she has to work more hours in the family business. Uh, she wants to continue her degree, but you're worried about her circumstances. So it's quite natural in this circumstance to be concerned for the student, but also her mother and indeed for her studies. So in this case, the student has contacted you directly. So the communication has already started. And your role here as what we would say is to keep that open line of communication with the student so that you continue to build trust, because in this type of circumstance, there's going to be lots of issues that arise both immediately for the student, but also throughout the course of her studies so that she, she needs to be able to feel that she can come to see you whenever um, she needs support. So after the initial response to this, after you've responded to the student, you're, you're going to have to be able to show assurance that, that you're going to be there to help her. And it's about being in that having that openness and approachability and engaging in that continuous dialogue with the student so that, you, that an initial meeting with Leah is going to probably try to discover her issues and particularly around her own health to make sure uh, that she is OK in this type of circumstance and that at least that there is some sort of understanding of her circumstances from herself, the impact that her mother's illness will have on her and indeed the commitment that she's going to now have to be given to uh, the family business and what impact that will have on her studies. So that dialogue is, is really about trying to unpick the fuller circumstances here and the impact that this will have on Leah and her studies. So in, in, in the course of that meeting, yes, there are going to be certain signposting to various professional services such as health and wellbeing services. And that's merely to allow Leah to have the professional ear of somebody who's professionally trained to deal with circumstances like this and to help them to explore in more, more depth the issues they're facing to allow them to at least create a, a means to deal with this issue. I also, given the fact that she's going to be facing various assessments, you may well feel that it's, there is a benefit for the student to be directed or signposted to various support clinics that exist perhaps in the department in order to ensure the student can continue to realise that aim. In terms of the information that you're going to provide to the student, so after the student has left the meeting with you, you're going to have to have some sort of email for the student where you are engaging with them in a more for, uh, at least a way to provide a friendly email that sets out the support mechanisms that are available so that at least then she has a one email that she can go to in the future with a, a, a set of or a, a piece of information that she has somebody to contact. And in this case, the follow up, it, although it's, the, 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 the program is um, or the framework in this instance is about showing a, a consistent means to follow up with the student. In this case, it's going to be a, probably a continuous basis over the course of their studies that you're going to continually check in with the student to see how are they manage in their studies, how are they being able to uh, engage with their family business, but also the care of their mother and so on. So on that basis, the follow up in this instance is not just necessarily going to be one follow up and one one quick fix in this instance. It's going to be something that has an enduring impact over the course of her degree. And, and what I would say is that when, whenever you're thinking about this, is is that think well, how would you actually respond to this if somebody come in uh, with this sort of information to you? 
and uh, knowing that uh, the impact and at least trying to foresee the impact that this would have on a degree, how would you actually visualise this and what approach would you take that might be slightly different? And I think everybody comes to this with their own unique personal touch and therefore whenever you're thinking through this framework from contact through to follow up, how would you respond ever so slightly differently? And again, I just want to say thank you so much for listening to this and we would uh, uh, appreciate your uh, feedback on the project by uh, accessing it on uh, the links provided and we'd happy, happily take any questions at this point. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that um, recording um, and the, the really interesting presentation as well. Um, I think we've got our speakers here with us today. Um, great. Oh, hi. You suddenly just by magic appeared on the screen. Um, so I'm interested then, I think, while we wait for some other questions to come into the chat. Um, you talked about that balance between the work that the tutors were doing and then the work that the professional services were doing. Um, I just want to link to that. What were the professional development needs of tutors so did, did you identify or have to respond to specific professional development needs um, as far as the tutors were concerned as, as you rolled this out thanks very much for the, for the question charlotte i can come in on that i think that's that's a really key point and i think that's something that we were continually aware of in particular that i think academic staff feel generally often like well, we don't have the training to be dealing with a lot of these situations. And I think particularly as, as student circumstances have, have got ever more complex and particularly over the last two years, we've been dealing with a lot of a lot of serious welfare cases. I think a lot of the time we felt like, oh, I don't have the training to necessarily be able to do this. Um, I think what's key in that respect and one of the things that, that, I, that I think we, we were continually aware of was being aware of, of, of your own kind of institutional makeup and institutional composition in terms of exactly what support is available. And I think that was one of the things that for us was key in terms of being able to effectively signpost. So being able to know, okay, this is not something I can deal with myself, first of all, but also being able to effectively signpost to the correct place within the institution, with the, within the institution being, being preferable, um, but also you know, being well-versed in, in, in external support options. And I think in terms of training, I think a, a key kind of point of, of a focus for us and, and something we discussed a lot was, was the need possibly for, for mental health training, um, particularly in for academics, mental health first aid, of course, for example. And I think this, this was something that a lot of, of academic staff feel will be beneficial in order to purely enable them to feel like they can support the student in that first instance. You know, I, I think the key thing um, to underline is that you know we, we we can't support students with with complex needs ourselves but what we can do is provide them with empathy and signpost them to appropriate support and i think in doing so some initial training might be beneficial i don't know whether my colleagues want to add anything to that thanks laura i i, I would just add as well in relation to the internally i think it's about communication as well making sure that internal staff are, are aware of the support services so from the perspective of making sure uh, that they know the different types of services that the student can be saying posted to and where and maybe sometimes that could be involving the staff member maybe making the first step with with the student maybe perhaps speaking to, to well-being and and making sure that they're, they're, they're supported from that perspective so i think in, in training is part of it but also clear on the communication channels within uh, within the department as well not sure, Raf. Uh, if you want to add anything to. I can't see Raf on my screen to know whether he does or, or not, but um, I think so often it's about, isn't it, making sure that context is clear and that kind of broader structure is clear for colleagues so that they understand where their role begins and ends and also that there is this kind of support network going on um, around them. And I think you've really encapsulated that in, in your answers. Um, that was obviously one of the bigger hurdles, I imagine, for, for rolling this out. I wonder if there were any other challenges um, that you came across and also where you think the development areas are, so where you might want to take this next. I 
think I'll, I'll just come in in the first instance. I think one of the key challenges was staff and student expectations and aligning staff and student expectations. Because I think, you know, firstly, from, from a kind of staff perspective, I think we all, I mean, we found just between the three of us, we probably all had slightly different ideas of exactly, you know, where our role starts and finishes, you know, where we would sort of signpost and pass over and where we would perhaps sort of, you know, deal with, with, with the students' concerns ourselves. And I think, you know, put, putting that into the broader departmental context, but then putting that into a wider kind of institutional context or a national or even an international context, I think we all would have very different ideas and therefore adopt quite different approaches to student support. Uh, and exactly how we approach student support. And I think in line with that, students' expectations very much vary as to exactly what they, what kind of support they can expect. And I think that's something we've all encountered in our service roles supporting students that we've had on the one hand, students who essentially didn't really realize that they can, they can gain any sort of support from us. Um, to students who, you know, wanted a lot of support from us, probably more support than, than we were actually able to provide. And I think, you know, the alignment of those expectations is certainly something we've, we've found as a, as a challenge, both, you know, between staff, but also between students and then aligning staff and students, I think is, is more difficult. I don't know whether you want to add anything there, Noel, or come in on the second point. Thanks so much, Laura. And I would just say as well that I think a, a key challenge that we found and we've, we've uh, a chapter that's coming out in a book with Ray Routledge is this division between academic support and pastoral care. Where do we draw that line? And often students' problems are so interconnected that you just can't separate these two. And I, I think for, for, for us, that that's probably been one of the, the key uh, challenges is, is how do we how do we separate these two or can they be separated and ultimately what, what we had argued is that they're really now so interconnected that the line between them is virtually blurred and I think that's part of the challenge is getting staff and indeed students as well uh, in, in, in their understanding of this division between academic and pastoral support. And just just Thank to come in. Oh. Oh, sorry. Just to come in on the second part of, of your question as well, you know, that how, how are we kind of taking this forward? This has kind of formed the basis, uh, I think, as, as Noel mentioned, you know, it's, it's formed the basis of, of, of several publications, but it's also formed the basis of a funding bid that we're just in the process of preparing, essentially looking at discerning the factors influencing students engaging with support or not engaging with support in order essentially to improve the overall efficacy of the system. Thank you. I wish we had more time to unpack this and I'm definitely going to go away and read uh, those papers that you've just referred us to and, uh, and look forward to that chapter as well. I'm sure many colleagues here will do the same. So thank you very much um, to all three of you for that presentation um, and, and for your answers to the questions as well.